Hello and welcome to Audiovisual Cultures. I am Paula Blair. Thank you for joining me for another foray into the world of media, arts and culture. This conversation was originally recorded as a contribution to the Slack's radio residency at the Newbridge Project. The Newbridge is an artist's studio, gallery and project space in Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of England. More information about all of that is linked in the show notes wherever you're accessing this episode, along with loads of other useful links about today's guests. I'm really pleased to present this longer cut of my chat with directors of Vane, Paul Stone and Chris Yates, who generously talk through some of Vane's history as an artist-led organisation and gallery, and its recent necessitated move from Newcastle to Gateshead. We also talked about the impact of the pandemic, as well as the lingering ramifications of the 2008 economic crash, and how just all of these things have affected the arts ecology and funding and everything quite generally. Hopefully by the time this episode releases there will be firmer plans that we can share about what 2022 is looking like for Vane which significantly has its 25th anniversary in the summer. Do check our socials for that. We are AV Cultures Pod. I'll probably be doing a lot of sharing of what Vane are up to. I know as I record this certainly on Instagram they're sharing past exhibitions that they want to highlight from the past 25 years years do check them out there vein gallery wherever you're looking for on socials as ever a huge big massive thank you to all our listeners for tuning in and to all of our very generous patrons at patreon.com forward slash av cultures for keeping us going As you'll hear in this episode, it's a really tough climate for all areas of arts and the creative industries just now. And a big message coming out of this conversation is the arts are non-negotiable and we need to fight for them. We need to fight as well for arts criticism. I always keep coming back to the conversations I always had with Sally Madge about value and worth. So I really hope that any of you listening can take away some messages about around those things and that we can really start to push back on the cuts we're facing in arts and humanities education and the arts and culture sector. For now, I'm going to pass you over to Paul and Chris. It's really, really insightful. I hope you get a lot out of it and I hope it does give you some food for thought and we can really figure out how we can make more of a difference. Paul Stone and Chris Yates, thank you so much for joining me for this. I've been really keen to speak to you both about Vane for some time and I'm just delighted at this Slacks Radio residency giving me the excuse to finally jump in and give you both a shout. Vane was established in 1997 and I think its age and the timing of that is something we might talk about a little bit. But could each of you in turn describe your roles as directors and maybe a bit of your own history with Vane? We'll try Paul first and then we'll move on to Chris. It'll be nice to get the voice attached to names as well. Hi, so I'm Paul and I'm the creative director of Vane. Um, I'm also, I mean, a director, there's two kinds of director. I'm a director of Vane as a company, but also the creative director means I'm in charge of programme, but also many other things. There is only two of us in the organisation, so we have to share a lot of tasks between us. The important thing to sort of say is that it didn't actually set Vane up um, but it was involved from the very early days and, sin- and from its first sort of public manifestation and over the years kind of fell into this role rather than, you know, it wasn't a job that I applied for because there was no job to start with, sort of helped create the job. I mean, my background in terms of the northeast is that I came here as a student in the late 80s. I went to Northumbria, from which I have a BA and MA in fine art. I was quite busy as an artist after graduation. Largely, most of the stuff I was doing was outside of the region. One of the things that led me to become involved in organising projects and become attached to Vane when it was set up was the fact that there weren't many opportunities for artists in the North East. So we decided to make our own, basically. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm the other director 
vein. We are obviously a small organisation, but we have, a, as Paul says, a long history. I was involved from the initial steps back in the 90s. I was actually also a student at Northumbria, but I was doing my MA, MA Fine Art, that is. And there was an organisation, well, not even an organisation, a group of artists that just used to meet on a regular basis in pubs around the city centre. And we were really just a talking shop. People would just get together and discuss their work. And it was first mooted at one of those meetings back in 96 that it'd be good to have a grassroots event. It was at that point that we decided it'd be a kind of, um, we wouldn't call it a festival, but a, a, a series of events around the city. Eventually that became... Vein 97, the first Vein event, as Paul was saying, was, it was a way of actually creating opportunities for artists in the area. We always wanted to do something which showcased what was going on. It was always open access at that point. So it was always going to be open access to any, any artists that were involved. So as I say, I was, I'm actually from the Northeast originally, so I was born in Newcastle. But I moved all over the country, so I actually did my first degree down in Cardiff. So doing an MA... Um, relatively later, I was a mature student, I suppose, at Northumbria. It was way back into my practice at the time as an artist. At that point, I hadn't actually done any organising of other shows. So that was a big move, I think. And that was, you know, and moved over into the dark side of organising rather than producing work so much. But in those early vein events, the first four from vein 97 to 2000, both Paul and myself did participate as artists but later on we moved aside from that role which will go into another point I don't know if that's enough for the moment about me that's lovely thank you it's really great to hear more about both of your backgrounds because you do so much facilitating of so many other artists so it's nice to have a bit of a spotlight on each of you I think in case there's anyone listening who doesn't know very much about Fian, how do you think it would be best described now. So you've given us a nice idea of the history of how it emerged, but how has it been operating really since then? I mean, it's quite a difficult question. It's one that's sort of constantly debated because it's sort of not just cases sort of, I mean, it's a longer story. You could perhaps do a series on that sort of development. And we are looking at examining some of that over this year because we're doing a lot of work on the archive at the moment. We can talk about more later. But this kind of sort of more than two phases to vein, this sort of has been a long process. But to answer your question, we started out and we called ourselves an artist led organization. Then, as Chris pointed out, because we, when it became more of a job, as in and involving payment, which it didn't at the beginning, we stood aside from that as artists. Now, we more recently, this is fast forwarding through decades, a couple of decades, we're beginning to sort of use the phrase artist led again. We're not starting to show our own work again, just because we feel that actually that is a good description of what we do. And it never really wasn't the case, despite the fact that our own artistic practice might have been put on the back burner as we became whatever we were, organisers, curators, facilitators. But actually that's always been very, very much the core of how we've approached Fain as a project. It has been an artistic practice. There's a long conversation to be had about what is artist-led, what isn't, who uses it, who doesn't. We've been very much involved in that world. And when we, throughout Vane's history, sort of deciding what the best model for ourselves was, has always been very much picking and choosing what we thought were the best bits from other models. It means that we needed, you know, guidance when we set up from other places and parts of that sort of network. And we still look at things today and not what's sort of interesting to us, either as something that an area that we should be working in as well, or whether we're looking at stuff and saying that's what shouldn't be happening, you know, and it's kind of what we do is sort of in reaction because that's part of the process of sort of formulating what we do. And we've only really come to that sort of decision over the last, during the sort of pandemic, whilst we haven't had yeah. very much of a public profile like a lot of places because we've been not open. Plus, we've had also had to relocate in the last year. So that's also meant we haven't been so publicly open. So it's almost like we're re emerging now as artist-led and using that title I say there's a whole sort of debate about really what is artist-led and whether we should use it whether other people should be using it it's a lot of going back to that history of how and all the sort of whatever you want to call it peer group that we've been part of around the UK and even abroad a lot of things that start off artist-led I would argue are not really artist-led anymore 
because they become institutionalized and one thing that runs through vein i think is a resistance to being institutionalized and that's a challenging place to be in because it means it's not just a sort of stance it's not a superior stance or meant anything like that because if you pay the price for that as well as in like if you don't take certain routes you know you won't get money for certain things i mean we do get some money for things but you know it keeps you in a certain no man's land in some cases, but Vane was set up really as a sort of, it sound a bit over grand to say it was sort of in resistance of what was happening at the time. And I think there's always been a little bit of, I don't know what the word would be, spikiness, I suppose, almost like sort of within our whole history of like refusing to do things in a certain way, not just sheer bloody mindedness, but just because actually we think there's a different way to do it. I think one of the things that we've almost been reluctant to use, one of the terms we don't, in some ways we don't think of ourselves as curators as such. Neither of us have come from a, a a formal curating background in terms of doing a BAMA in that subject. We've always taken the part of the role of being more a facilitator for artists, I think, is, is a better term for what we do, in that we would never really have a presented as sort of a heavy-handed approach. We said, this is the theme and this is what you're going to do. I mean, we do have, obviously, we, we have put shows together which are themed, but we've always allowed the artist the room to to that not it's never been a question of we have dictated what was done in terms of uh, obviously there are, we, we direct we help we assist in certain ways but we, we've never taken that very very heavy-handed role this is the theme and you will slot into it in that way if that makes sense i mean much of the program is curated by artists yes so i mean that's kind of who gets to create that obviously is down to a number of things where i mean some of that's proactively sort of invited by us some of it's comes to us mm. from sort of whatever anything from direct proposals to maybe negotiation over years of people saying well I've got this idea so I suppose you know our level of involvement in that then can be minimal to quite major and that won't necessarily but that level won't be publicly viewable I'm not going to talk about specific cases because it's not meant to be so I suppose it's not an ego driven yeah. curation even if we are sort of involved in that curation so definitely and going back to the artist led thing I mean the program very much is when we're working and, and likewise the other end of the scale when we're working on solo shows which we do quite a lot of again some of those things come very much as a almost finished product some of them are a lot more loose and unformed as an idea and maybe we work with that kind of artist in more detail and this again that's not necessarily visible from the outside and neither is it meant to be mm. because it's not about and neither am I claiming it's sort of all this open free-for-all because it's not. No. It's mainly started like that, but it's not now. We took a long time moving away from that. I mean, it's kind of about trying to do the guiding rather than yes. imposing. There's all sorts of other agendas there, also external ones that, as we do, you know, receive public money, obviously there's certain things there that sort of expected. I don't mean that we do things that we don't want to, because that's not true. But again, it's not just a sort of personal taste. I think from the outside, we get this quite a lot. I think a lot of people, artists particularly, you know, kind of think that sit there all day scratching our chins going thumbs up, thumbs down to people's work. And it's just so far from the truth. We don't really do that full stop or it's about, you know, 0.25% of the time, if that. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, we have to say no to a lot of, you know, really good things yeah. that we'd really like to do. There is, you know, I mean, if anything sort of like when say external agendas, I mean, there's an obligation to have a sort of balance and look outside of our own experience and backgrounds in terms of content of the programme, mm -hmm. you know, which I feel that we do. That comes from people, I mean, where we approach people, some of the times people kind of not shy of approaching us. I mean, one of the things I think Paul says, it's, it's, it's a question of moving beyond our own, if you like, personal tastes about art. I mean, one of the things we, we try and, well, we do avoid, we do, definitely do avoid, is having this kind of tokenism in the way we program. We're very aware of all the debates and ideas on uh, inclusivity. And when we do it, we do it in a, when we program in a very, um, it's a personal way. It's a, we have a, our own flavour that we want to give to things and we have our own ideas about it. But we, we want to, to give the artists in the most, if you like, inclusive way, use the term, but we want to give them their freedom and their actual voice, not ours and such. Mm -hmm. But we're very conscious of being part of that bigger field, of being in that open, that bigger world 
were very anxious, were well, not anxious, but were very inclusive in that sense. And often we not we, we wouldn't show work that we couldn't stand behind, but it, it may not be specifically to our personal tastes as such, if that makes sense. Well, so I think notions of what that means, you know, change over time. So I mean, yeah. one, you know, one recurring thing over Vane's long lifespan now is that there's certain things, you know, could say the kind of mission or whatever that's been sort of constant from the very beginning, mm. or no, Vane has actually taken many forms. But I mean, particularly, I think over the last few years where part of a wider debate about access yeah. to well, all sorts of things, but I mean, particularly sort of within the art world, where mm-hmm. sort of doing shows where actually people are not artists anymore, yeah. or not anymore, never were artists, are non-artists, where you actually sort of give the gallery space. But that's constant, whether actually you're talking to a high concept curated show or whether you're talking about having a group that actually aren't artists, for whatever reason, they've involved in creativity and they're looking for a space to show work. Yeah. I suppose what Vane does is give the space to those people. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it'd be disingenuous to say there's no kind of negotiation mm-hmm. about stuff. I mean, obviously there's certain things can, can't do for whatever reason. It wouldn't be fair to say it's all just completely open. But I mean, it's basically like trying to get that person to actually articulate what they're doing yeah. as best as possible with helping them, but not trying to put them in. Again, I mean, keep coming up with the word that keeps coming is sort of institution. I mean, think, you know, people sort of, in, there's a huge pressure to sort of institutionalise yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's very weird. It's weird for me to even talk about the as an organisation when it's two people. <laughs> Mm. It's two people that kind of share everything between themselves, as in workload and things like that. Maybe roping in a, someone to <coughs> hang a show every now and again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a whole bigger, again, you could make a whole series about what is the access. We are seen, you know, I'm sure is seen as an institution by some people outside because we've been around so long, and especially sort of a younger artist or whatever, we're just there. However, I would kind of refute that. I mean, one of the things that Bain was founded on was because... And it wasn't just lack of opportunities because, you know, you see stuff all the time. Well, you know, take over an empty shop, have a show yeah. or put your work in. Great. But yes, Vane was sort of doing that. But it's also, I mean, there really was back in the dark days, 1996. I mean, the fewer galleries full stop. To be a local artist then, I mean, was largely dominated by staff at one of the two universities in Newcastle. Yeah. I'm talking to the right? mm-hmm. Newcastle, not the Greater North East. In fact, there were shows, you know, and if it was Newcastle, there was a Newcastle group. It was artists mm-hmm. who taught mm-hmm. those two universities. Outside of that academic system, yeah. there was mm-hmm. no, well, there were studio groups, which is actually Vane's early beginnings very much grew from a lot of studio groups. Yeah. Not studio groups probably as we think of now, like things like Newbridge and things like that. These were, I mean, largely painters based because also, I mean, it does sound like the dark ages, you know, when you're talking about 1996, you have to remember that probably, it's true to say, a majority of people didn't have an email or a mobile. No, it's true. So when you're talking about how people networked, mm-hmm. <laughs> it wasn't doing things like what we're doing now. It wasn't being in a WhatsApp group. Well, that was the point. It started from that network, as I mentioned earlier, about the monthly meetings and pubs. Mm-hmm. There's that physical thing that was the only real way of doing it. They literally had to get there, and people used to bring their literally bring their work along. Never mind just photographs of their work, but bring their work along to show each other. Mm. <laughs> like that. It was a very different world from now. Yeah, you know, obviously that has you know it has a lot of downsides because again, it was I don't know I don't ever know really what's completely democratic in terms of networks because I think all kinds of networks mm. tend to sort of well, the good for the people that are in them. There's all kinds of ways that you sort of exclude people not deliberately but unconsciously, and that's something you just need to keep looking at. I mean, those meetings were kind of people that came to the pub once a week in the evening. We had the higher room at the pub, whatever. We sat down, you know, we, we voted on decisions, you know, 30 mm-hmm. people putting their hands up in the air or not. Maybe it's 15 or 15. <laughs> There's a hell of a lot. I mean, there's also a lot of sort of mythology around artists-led stuff being democratic or collective. You know, I mean, it's it's fine in some instances, in other instances, and that's the story of Vane. I won't bore you with all this the intricate details of it over those first sort of four or five years before we had a gallery of actually having to go, we can't be making these decisions with their 30-way votes every time. At some point, if it's to progress beyond, we came from as reaction to there not being any opportunity, we created opportunity, and the other people yeah. involved created opportunity but then actually you hit another level of where do you go next actually to go somewhere next someone really has to be in charge yeah or you stay where you were there was a big debate i mean i haven't really talked about you know in the 90s when we set up when the national lottery started in the early 90s the funding that went into the arts on that there was a year of something up until the year of 2000 year 2000 yeah. year of the artist so those year of architecture was a year of literature and it was either different city or region in 1996 the northeast of england and cumbria had the year of visual arts right. so there were a lot of official kind of celebrations things like that a lot of big name artists largely parachuted in yeah. there was some official kind of stuff some of which i was part of 
as a you know part of the official program. Also, there was lots of fringe stuff. Now, Vain started in 1997 because it actually grew out of the discussions artists were having in 96 and how yes. they felt that they actually wanted to do something. And although some of those artists had done something in 96 as a sort of fringe salon de refuse against sort of what was happening in 96, or just not really against what was happening in 96, to say, actually, please look at us as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. We are here. Vain was actually always, even though it was kind of a bit ramshackle to start with, it always was a bit about looking at sort of longer term. Mm-hmm. So that's why it didn't actually do stuff straight away. It actually saying, well, let's build something that kind of exists. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, and it was kind of funding led, I suppose, in some ways, that there was this idea of doing this annual event. We hate using the word festival. It's a bit like a festival of doing it. So there's Vain 97, Vain 98, Vain 99, Vain 2000. Because a long story short, kind of went from 50 artists in 97, largely sort of painters, you know, open studios and things like that. By the time it got to 2000, we were doing 80 exhibitions over two months and 200 artists mm. largely sort of empty shops which were taking over and that coincided with one of the cycles of generation new customers lots of empty shops you know so it grew into this monster almost yeah. in those four years very good but a real kind of and that's the thing that people don't know so much now well because it's a generation mm. ago we're kind of looking at in terms of looking at our archive there was actually talk then about well it's got so successful in inverted commas mm. we can keep doing this mm. you know and we could do it every year like chris said it's open participation but actually well who was going to do it we weren't i mean we were either not working as in on the doll or working part-time and things like that i mean the energy it reached a point of stopping also I was, you know, coming from my background and, you know, I think it served its purpose. Yes. So the thing was, what actually, what does fame become next? And actually what it became was a few selected, working with I mean, people from the network I was talking about earlier, largely artists led some sort of more institutional kind of partners, things like that. So we did a few years of sort of selected shows, yeah. sort of curated shows um, in the early 2000s before we actually just then decided to move on to another phase of going, because when they were selected, actually a lot of the same artists were getting selected each time. Like saying, well, actually, let's set up a gallery and just be done with this kind of turning empty shops into temporary spaces all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, we still kind of do that to an extent, but hope we have that space for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> but that was actually what better served. And, you know, and also actually what Bain was doing in the beginning it's really time to pass the baton on to other people mm-hmm. you know, to kind of do that sort of stuff. I'm not, um, I'm no way, I'm, I'm very proud of what we did and what we actually created in those first few years, the impact that it had. And, you know, perhaps some people don't understand the impact that it's actually had on what exists in the world today because actually they've inherited some of the yeah. benefits of what we, I mean, none of what we did was, I would claim was, you know, was original. As I said before, we did it by looking at examples of what people had done elsewhere yeah. and we learned from that and took from that, you know, and it's what I learned as being an artist, being part of shows between graduation before I ever became involved in a organizing if you like took those lessons and kind of applied them to here and it's not the case that there's no history of that happening in the northeast before so again I'm not claiming the sort of god or anything and invented the whole thing we didn't but we'll take credit mm. for taking energy to do it you know and the other people that mm. we worked with then we all went off and got proper jobs eventually you know because, because you know because actually <laughs> You know, one thing that you know, Chris and I share, you know, is the sheer bloody mind just to stick it out through mm-hmm. the times. You know, it's, yeah. it's easy to describe the history as this sort of upwards trajectory, and that's just not true. <laughs> you know, there's ebbs and flows, and indeed, going from those different phases, you know, the fallow, the type of years when we didn't do anything, we were still working on stuff. Yes. So like I say, we all had to keep a roof over our head anyway, and it barely does now. But it kind of, it's sort of, it's ebbs and flows. Again, it goes back to this thing, there's a lot of mythology making around sort of artist-led stuff. I suppose around institutions as well, to be honest. It's the art world for it as well. There's lots of mythology that's always not good trajectory in terms of success. People don't really like to talk about the fact that actually there's setbacks. Well, exactly. Things like when we funding fell through and things like that, you know, always, always caused problems. But yeah, I mean, you have to reassess just reassess what you're doing. But, I mean, one of the things, obviously, we've never we've never wanted to be, and I don't think we've never had, we've never been funding driven in that way. And I think that's one of the things that we, that's part and parcel of invo- avoiding being this institution. You see it, you see people chasing the money, as it were, by servicing, constantly just servicing funding. You see, you often see organisations ceasing to be what they started out to be and becoming basically a, a service organisation for a dream yeah. I mean, you pay the price of that. Yeah. I mean, you pay the price of that. You don't have access to it. Not just, oh, we don't obviously have, you know, can't find this grant, can't find that grant. Overall, you won't get as much money. Yeah. And we both should be earning more. <laughs> Everyone probably thinks that. But, you know, you just won't get it if you don't actually play this role. Or we should have, or the expectation more is actually that you don't stay with an organisation, Grace. So that's going back to that idea, like, you know, Bain as an artistic practice for us is that, 
because you see it through me. Other people might say just well, yeah. I know, you know, people. I know people. I know people that were there in the early days. Things like whatever went off, did whatever. You know, they didn't necessarily even stay in the arts. We have to stay in the arts. You know, could have been directed to this institution, whatever. And problem for that doesn't interest me. The possibility of earning twice as much as I do now might interest me, but, you know, that hasn't been enough to actually make me go off and do that. Mm. You know, and it's not because it's easy to stay where we are, because it's certainly not easy, because, it's, you know, there's a, yeah. there's a huge amount yeah. of responsibility to what we do, you know, and it's mm-hmm. kind of, it can be very fragile. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I guess most people are feeling a bit fragile at the moment, especially arts or mm-hmm. uh, businesses feeling fragile at the moment because we've just been through such a terrible couple of years. And yeah without wanting to dominate this conversation with sort of talk about the pandemic, you know, one of the things is that you might not think it to look at us. <laughs> it's a good job. I'm glad to send you sound. <laughs> that actually, you know, I would argue that we're very agile. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's again that sort of thing, you know, when you're talking to funders and things, you know, this sort of idea, this sort of anti sort of institutional side that we have, it's questioned all the time. Well, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? But actually come this terrible, terrible thing that's happened to the world over the last couple mm-hmm. of years, actually managed to pivot pretty quickly to actually yeah. surviving and yeah. it's not without help from other people i'm not saying we know we have but actually without you know massive claiming emergency money and things like that i mean our model has actually proved to be very sustainable mm-hmm. because actually it can yes. be because it is so flexible i think that's the thing that we we have gone through changes and we've managed those changes as an organization i would say pretty well mm-hmm. over the years yeah. and we've shown adaptability and they're not always, I mean, some of those changes, you know, talking about the history of how we've changed, you know, from non-venue based to more venue based, whatever. I mean, it's always been because that's better served, I think, what our sort of ambitions are for the organisation. Mm. You know, it's always been a mixture of choosing what we think is best or actually what we think is best artistically. Mm. Mixed with some, you know, there's some pragmatism about, you know, where we are, what we can do, what we do have to do, because we have to have a base level of support. Yes. You know, we're not trust fund kids. Mm-hmm. We don't have that privilege, to use a word that's very popular today, about mm. what we do you know i mean so some of those routes we've taken has been enforced by external circumstances again obviously the last couple of years it's been the biggest ever external circumstance it's kind of done it but it's unfortunate also that we kind of at that point had to move from our venue which was always going to happen one day and we had two years there yeah. guaranteed i mean ended up being there for a decade mm-hmm. it wasn't the best time in some ways to move in the middle of a pandemic having said that it was becoming ever more expensive and when you go through a period of being shut more than you're open you realize mm-hmm. how much you're paying to service that space so yeah. we've scaled down a bit, well, not bit, quite a bit in terms of size. You know, that's the practical side of it. We need to actually sort of downscale a bit because, you know, we've, we, as in the country, whatever the world, has never really recovered from the fact we had a financial crash, which is now almost 15 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Things has been fairly sort yeah. of standstill since then. The mm-hmm. amount of debt that's being run up as a result of the pandemic is scary. Mm-hmm. They will never be repaid within our lifetimes. There's not much hope, you know, the magic funding fair is coming and giving us more money. In terms of responding to the future, we have to sort of take on a mixture of sort of choice, again, choice on external circumstances, you know, kind of say actually get something that's more manageable. It's only been um, impressed on us even more over the last two years, how much we need to survive on what we've got and um, mm-hmm. make it more manageable. So that will be more manageable in the new space we're going to, which is still bigger than the space we had for the last one. This is now our third permanent gallery okay. space. We've moved to in Gateshead, yeah. which we're in the process of preparing. You know, I mean, it's twice as big as the gallery we had, the first gallery space, which we had from 2005 to 2011, which was King's House, yes. which is behind Central Station in Newcastle, where the new oh, station right. is. We had a tiny sort of room in there, you know, so it's much bigger and cheaper. I think, I think it's interesting. The, the other thing about this new space, this the streamlining, as it were, the, the fact that we won't be, you know, the, the, we're not servicing this big building again. Mm-hmm. It kind of opens up a, a whole new range of opportunities in, a, in an interesting way. In some ways, going back to the early days of Bain as well, so we can be more, even more reactive to taking over empty spaces again and doing pop up shows. You know, with the common vernacular now, we didn't used to call it pop up shows back mm-hmm. in the day. <laughs> the pre-gallery days but we have all of this a different kind of flexibility if you like because it's a it's opening up different kinds of opportunities working for artists as well as the organization but also we can re-examine again and look at the changing role of the gallery as it were in the ecology to use that awful term but with the changing role within the community of artists and, and the bigger community that we're part of we're becoming even more embedded in that in that sense of the that we're not just this 
ivory tower that were very much part of these bigger communities, these whole interconnected communities beyond the, as it were, the artistic community as well, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of those are choices that are things that we were considering anyway. Obviously, more recent events yeah. have jolted us into rethinking things. I mean, I've gone on about how we're not an institution, but we were becoming, there was a danger that actually you blink and sometimes actually some of the things you say you never do have happened. <laughs> you know, and I think that's just true of anything in life. But then when in the middle of the lockdown, you know, it was going into work and looking at these big, but it's big, it's not big by some people's standards, you know, quite big empty gallery spaces and knowing we couldn't do anything mm. in them. Then the relocation came into being, you know, so I actually thought, actually, let's not try and replicate this. I suppose that's the point I'm making really is like, there's always a sort of like pressure and it can be pressure on yourself, from yourself, you know, say actually, well, next we need to replicate what we did before. And actually that's not the mm. case. Maybe it's just a chance to start to do something different. You no, know, so I think that's what again, not entirely unique, but I think that's has sort of run through Vane's history. But also resisting that thing of actually, well, you've done this, so actually you need, what you need to do is the same again, but actually make it bigger. Yeah. It's sort of a bit of a change, but I'm not really convinced how much of a change there has been in the world. I mean, call me cynical. But mm. this kind of idea of incremental growth in everything is mm-hmm. not actually is actually incompatible with the idea of sustainability, whether you're talking in the most obvious yes. way about environmental or whatever. It has to sort of change in some ways, but there's always this thing like, you know, jump higher, jump higher, jump higher. And it's just not in terms of what resources it's consuming, whether it's actually your emotional resources, you know, and chance you actually burn out, you know, or whether actually it's the physical resources in terms of just like what we're doing to the planet, etc. And that's just looking about what you actually want from life and like what you, what's interesting to do. Yes, because that's what, one of the things that's really, for, for me, is one thing that's come out of the pandemic, if you like, has been this idea of, of reassessing the, the life work balance, mm-hmm. you know, and what we want out of, what we all want out of, but we don't want I want what we want is and what we want the organisation to be as well, I think. It has changed our my thinking anyway, a little bit on it. Yeah, I mean yeah. you have to think about what you want, say in the time that's left. And that sounds a bit morbid, you know, but then we've all <laughs> been really, really been presented. I mean, if, you know, we are getting on. You begin to think about it. You begin to think about, you know, well, especially when you've had 25 years, going like, well, it's not possible that I have 25 more years, but you know, I might not have 25 more years left on this earth. Mm-hmm. What do I just want to do in, I mean, I'm not going to be retiring early on what mm-hmm. I've earned. You know, so it's kind of like, well, what do I actually want from the next 10 years, 20 years, if that's what is professionally left? You know, that's say I've already mm-hmm. excluded myself from going off to another job, another arts organization almost i don't know if anyone locally would employ me I'm a bit too mouthy about kind of what i think about people as well i'm trying to best this broadcast not to name names <laughs> I, i'm available for you know getting in the corner of the pub i'll just tell you everything <laughs> I'm bookings. um you know so actually what do once you although we're kind of like famous part of it's not really quite true to say we were the solution to something, but we were part of addressing what we sort of see a problem. It's by no mm. means the case, I think, now that everything's fine. And I'm not talking about the pandemic there. I'm talking about sort of what exists mm. now. I mean, I still think there's still a room for a different kind of voice. Mm. Yeah, I could expand on that, but I really reluctant because it's hard to do that actually sort of pointing fingers at kind of what I think other people do that's kind of like wrong. What I mean is this, there, there's just different kinds of challenges now. There's always kind of challenges. Yeah. The challenges that were there 25 years years ago maybe not there anymore there's different kind of challenges there there's still pricks to be kicked against if you like mm. what they might just be different ones to the ones that they were there and you know people are welcome to point fingers at us if they want because you know people might see what have again in inverted commas success vain everyone's success is always kind of one way at the expense of someone else mm. because there are limited resources to go around we have some part of those resources not as much as the people but you know I know some part of those resources but actually other people say well I could do better with that so I suppose that's the challenge to us Mm. say are we doing the if not the best because again that very much sort of talk that gets thrown at us gets thrown at everyone kind of like the present funding like you're doing the best the best the best it's the best you end up talking to press release talk you know and I don't think that's useful Mm -hmm. because I think actually you know you kind of have to admit that you're not necessarily the best because actually if you're the best it I mean, I hate in one way, I hate that competitive side to things. Yes. It's naive to think that we're not because we are competing. When you're applying for funding, you're competing. 
someone gets it, someone doesn't. And it's not as simple as the best person won, because it never is. Mm-hmm. So that's not true of life. And again, ask me personally. Off the record, I'll give you a long list of people that think, <laughs> you know, got that support. You know, I'll give you a long list of people that think, you know, we're more deserving. I spend a lot of time mm-hmm. helping, yeah. you know, again, it's not public visible, but we spend a lot of time helping artists write applications. Yeah. Not just artists that show they can kind of do it for yeah. other people as well. I mean, it's a bit of a put all your money on red number eight sometimes with these things. I mean, you have to you have to be above a certain level to get it. It's not just like, you know, random. But, you know, is it mm. fair? Well, define fair. Mm-hmm. Some people might not think it's fair. We get funded. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's fair. Other people get funded. You know, or how, what level and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you can go <laughs> on, on about that. I suppose it's just, just trying to be aware that actually there's a different way of doing things to the way you did them even a couple of years ago. It's not just occasioned by massive global events like a pandemic. It's also actually mm. down to more mundane mm. things. I'm going to make a big statement. Like, I actually think we're quite anti-establishment in lots of ways, and I get into trouble for that. I mean, we're not <laughs> included. We're not a player in certain areas in the northeast because I'm too outspoken about certain things. You know, so you're just not invited on some decision-making panels on things because people that are more acquiescent are invited on. <laughs> and I'm going to leave it at that. Lucky, you're, lucky you're not asking this. At, you know, not that I've been to a pub in months, but let's look at not asking this at you know, like ten o'clock. At, you know, nice in a pub, where I might name names, but you know, it's kind of forging our own way on that. Yes. Not without, I mean, what I will say, we're not without some respect for that, or else we wouldn't. You know, we are an Arts Council MPO, yeah. all but at a very low level. Yes. Yeah. Thing. That is validating, you know, it's a validation you know, from an ego point of view. It wouldn't happen if people didn't look at the work that was produced and say, well, some of that at least is good. Yeah. Our biggest supporters, our fans, are actually artists, because without that, I mean, they started, we know, with no resources other than energy and the energy of artists, including ourselves as artists, but Mm -hmm. all the artists that took part. And it still is heavily dependent on artists in the sense that both the artists that we work with, because like they're co-productions, you know, let's say whether they're solo shows or whether they're group shows, you know, they're co-productions, yeah. whether we've helped someone write a grant application or whether we just haven't, whether people are just turning up and doing the work. Without that, then we wouldn't have a reputation, which is a positive reputation. Mm-hmm. Also, we're not a big public gallery. It's not that we're not for other audiences and we're looking at that, you know, how we do stuff. I mean, obviously we did things that were very public in the early days, you know, then we've got a small space. There's no marketing manager. There's no education officer. <laughs> in better times, we do have groups of people coming through. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things, positive things about the Moon to Gate said is we're looking at some how it can sort of expand things a little bit more into community and the council there's receptive to that sort of working with us. Yeah. Again, that's all a bit hypothetical until we're actually allowed to meet properly with people. Yes. But yeah, I mean, artists are artists our main audience good things that happen at vain come to us through artists yeah. wanting to work with us and then sometimes i don't just mean like local people i mean like someone going away yeah and going to vain. i think that's the real validation for us is that we have that reputation and there's only to, to be honest it's an international reputation it's the profit is not without honor <laughs> i mean we do have a relatively large international mm-hmm. reputation i mean it's worth to say just because we do cover other areas it's a time given i mean when we decided although we're just entering a new phase now i think but everyone's probably is um when we sort of entered the gallery phase if you like in 2005 before that you know, we invited artists to work with us and some of those artists still working mm. with us, whatever it is, 17 years later. And some of the artists we work with have also worked in the early project days. So we've got some relationships going back 20 years or more with some artists, other artists, you know, completely new. So we're going to keep open to stuff. But we did approach a sort of small cohort of international artists Mm. for when we opened the gallery. It would be a part of our programme, but also going on doing stuff outside of the gallery. I mean, we also started doing art affairs Mm. in 2006, only a year after we started the gallery. I mean, Vane is a not-for-profit organisation. It doesn't Mm. mean we can't make money. But, I mean, the money made goes straight into... I mean, it's basically self... (laughs) What goes in goes out. So, I mean, when you say people art affairs, people think they can't quite get their head around being not-for-profit and then also Mm -hmm. entering this commercial world. But the point is, it is commercial. Mm -hmm trying to earn money, whether it's to run their organisation or whether it's an artist trying mm. to make money to sell some work. Mm. So, I mean, obviously we haven't physically been doing much over the last two years in terms of travelling, but mm. we have been doing online stuff. We've well, been quite a few places in the world with sort of artists' work, you know, and whether you actually sell anything or not, I mean, it's good sort of promotion for them yeah. and obviously our sales as well, which is good for the artists. It's quite an expensive thing to do. And I mean, it's also, it's, it's this sort of international activity has created other kinds of opportunities for artists. Again, not just for artists that we've shown specifically Specifically, but opportunities beyond even exhibiting, even career changing opportunities in some instances. And that's a great thing for us to see happening. 
I mean, we're looking a little bit, I mean, we haven't talked really much about because of 25 years, this actually in July is the actual sort of anniversary between starting imminently, but almost out of January, but we are starting before the end of January. We've been during the pandemic again, particularly sort of like doing a bit of a deep trawl through some of our archive, particularly those early years, but even more recent stuff, picking stuff out, making sure things are archived properly. That's going to be on our website. We're going to be doing sort of stuff on, you know, social media and things like that. So looking at artist stories mm. to try and so some of what we've been talking about will sort of be expanded upon in those some of those artist stories the people that we work with now yeah. people we work with in the past we're getting you know sort of short videos made of past shows and things like that so we're going to be i don't know around 150 or even like nearer 200 yes. by the time we finish doing that so we've been busy whilst we've been shut to the public we have been busy long for that, yeah. doing that kind of stuff you know so it's gonna be sort of a visual and sort of um what written document the document makes it sound a bit dry we're trying to sort of make it it's not just history. It's actually the history is very pertinent, I think, to today. I don't just mean to Bain. I mean, going back to that idea mm-hmm. of what is artist led, what is this, what is that, trying to draw that mm-hmm. out. So it's not just like, oh, here's our archive, here's some nice pictures of what exhibition we did 17 years ago. It's saying, well, why, this artist, yeah. what was there? If they were from outside Newcastle, what did they find? You know, so trying to ask, mm-hmm. you know, what they sort of thought of when they were here and things like that. So hopefully, that was good. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it is, is still very relevant today, you know, maybe reactivating it, if you like. Yeah. Well, contextualising, that's the word. Contextualising. Contextualising it, both the benefit of us, for our audience, you know, and hopefully for other people as well. So people can't, like, say, it's going back to the idea of, like, well, Bane, is it, what is it? It's another gallery. It's one of the mm. next amount of galleries. Well, this is our story. Yeah. And I'm not making qualitative judgments about whether they're better or worse. And well, I'm not going to say we're worse than anyone. <laughs> I'm, <gonna> say, <laughs> I'm not trying to say we're better than anyone. But actually, it's a different story to anyone locally. Yeah. Everyone has their own different story. So it's kind of trying to find, to find that out. To go a bit beyond, oh, here's a press release for our latest show. Mm. It's actually to go beyond that and sort of sell that and draw out. Fingers crossed by the time we actually get to the actual birthday, birthday, <laughs> June like, we'll actually be able to have some physical events and like discussions and yeah. talks and things like that. Let's hope we can all sort of come together and do that. We can have the benefit of seeing me in person ramble on a stage or something like that. <laughs> I don't know if we could put a stage. I don't know, build a stage at the gallery. <laughs> And like just talking for a month, so actually it's contextualised it in that sort of because I think it's still personal debate. It's not about just saying, "Oh, weren't we good at what we did?" So and so and things like that back in the day. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, it's looking back, but it's also kind of put into contemporary context because those debates. Yeah, we try and bring strands together of what we've been talking about. Those debates haven't gone away. Yeah, when you start out and you're kind of just like pushing and pushing and pushing, mm-hmm. pushing towards this better world or whatever, it sounds a bit sort of maybe over dramatic. But did it ever come? Well, no, one way it didn't. Yeah. You know, certain things got better. Certain things. Certain and things we probably contributed to creating are actually negative things for us now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we dropped calling it going back to the very beginning. We know we dropped calling ourselves arts led because actually, at one point, when we first got the offer of more regular funding from the Arts Council, it was said mm. to us it was a negative, right? So we yeah. It's meant like you never be professional, mm. which is mm. really a whole lot of problematics around that. Yes, this wouldn't happen today. No, 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 and then actually, you know, then it also artists led just thrown around this badge, but actually. What's it mean? Mm-hmm. On the one hand, it can just mean showing your mates. On the other hand, you know, you're institutional, but you're kind of sort of giving yourself this gloss that actually you sort of grassroots mm. when are you really? Anyway, let's say I'm not getting into that debate now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, another thing, so I bought in sort of the fact that we've had this in, done this international presence and, like, and the art fairs have been a route to that. Mm. It's primarily not even about taking part in an art fair. It's actually yeah. the fact that's a good route to get yourself somewhere for five days and showcase an artist's work to a lot of people. So the shows, I think actually it's more Berlin and New York done yes. a few things from both, haven't we? Yes. I can't even like going through the archive. I can't even remember everything from mm. some way back. But <laughs> it's kind of like that thing. So, so like I mean, outside of art fairs, I mean art fairs have been in lots more places. But I suppose those two arts. But doing those art fairs has helped us make contacts along yeah. with artists that we know and work with in those you know two major arts and global art centres. Yeah, I mean we're mm. in the kind of smallish kind of galleries, art centres, you know, studio based things. Again, part of a wider sort of if you want to call it peer group. Mm. But through that, so that's where we made those connections. They've been very positive, you know, and positive for the artists. Yeah. That's really more a motivating kind of thing to doing the international stuff. That's just making those connections. It's great if you can make some money as well, but not least just pay for the cost of doing it. Yeah. I mean, aside from that, also what happened when we moved into our now last home, we can't, can't quite get used to calling it that. Mm. So, moved out but we're there almost 10 years to the day from autumn yeah. 2011 to mid-september 2021 we moved out yeah. commercial in-house right in the center of newcastle mm-hmm. it's a big massive 
practice block and at the time but well, at various points you know, at one point obviously there was two other buildings within that same block that had new bridge and bruce creatives in so that at one point when there's literally hundreds of artists mm-hmm. and other both creative and charitable mm-hmm. organizations in there i mean there's much talk at the moment about you know it's sort of being uh, one of the words that the arts council uses relevance you know it also means connecting with different communities and points we actually had it in that building yeah. on our doorstep yeah. and none of it was actually sort of the actual mix was actually not supported financially by anyone no yeah. I mean, individual things like being supported there was other organizations both arts and non-arts organizations that received sort of different kinds of funding but actually what we had we had in that building so actually we were neighbors yeah mm-hmm. it was a true community and we worked together we still will work with some of those people but you know it's been a bit more of kind of yeah. different kind of just going upstairs and knocking on someone's door going like do you want to do this yeah but what we did so when we took on that building to get to more sort of basic level it's like chris and i also became two or three directors what's mm-hmm. now all this community and mm-hmm. um, to take on the lease initially but then you know we kind of became sort of more, more hands-off there's still sort of some kind of sort of direction to the building i mean beyond mundane things like making sure it had its annual fire check and things like that but also i mean now a third director john paul cavani has got his own organization amsterdam inventions within commercial union house so he's the third director of all this community to point out so he's involved in us now working aside from you know we reset we re whatever setting the gallery up now over in gateshead but we've got a mix instead of this tall building what we have we had eight nine floors in commercial union house we've now got different smaller sites around gateshead town center but that's still orbis so vein is part of that so there's different there's still one of the studio groups is moving in above us we kind of spread horizontally rather than vertically now yes it's smaller because unfortunately there's not enough space and because it was sort of time that it was protracted you know i mean orbis is sort of an umbrella organization some people have gone their own yeah. separate ways they had to they couldn't wait we tried to stay in newcastle which really wasn't happening yeah. you know it was more receptive in gateshead and i'd say it's only actually half a mile down the road from where we were mm. yes but then actually in some ways it's a very different context so i mean we'll see how that pans out in terms of all the different things that will be there like i say certainly there's plenty of artists around there mm. i mean we all of us that are directors of orbis work on an unpaid basis for that yeah. my point being so in some ways you know galleries say oh we do this arts professional development program we do do that with artists there and again not necessarily artists that we show in the gallery or whatever although some of them do yeah. end up showing the gallery for whatever project is we do all that kind of stuff you know we're involved in running studios part removed but a lot of it's quite boring and mundane stuff <laughs> but you know mm-hmm. running yeah. organization is a lot of boring mundane stuff but actually that is his part of the sort of wider support thing we don't make a big song and dance about it yeah we started making a big song dance about it because we realised when we had to move, I mean, mm. Bain was, had more of a safety net. Then we realised a lot of those other people, not realised, I suppose we kind of knew, a lot of those people didn't because actually people didn't know about what was happening there. Right. Some people, again, time for a more late night conversation. Some people chose to ignore mm. what was happening there yeah. and are not really, like, whatever they might say publicly, are not really interested in supporting artists, <laughs> despite it maybe being their job. Mm. Yeah. Supposedly, but you know, there's a wider, you know, once you talk about the wider sort of culture in the Northeast, then you know, well, not the wider Northeast, actually, sort of more like Newcastle. Yeah. You know, I think certain people are just happy if there's just an example of something mm-hmm. rather than actually an ecology of an ecology, an actual community, more different kinds of that thing. Does that make sense? I'm sort of slightly beating around the bush with that, saying like, you know, there should be, you know, I mean, obviously there are different studio groups, but I mean, they're kind of, there should be more, and actually, kind of, there should be more galleries. Is that utopian? I don't know. Going back to what I said about money not money for all of that but we weren't actually taking that much money to sort of be where where we were and actually there were possibilities we could have moved that somewhere else but mm-hmm. there wasn't really a will i mean i'm not going one way i'm not bothered to name names in terms of mm-hmm. i mean i'm particularly thinking the city council they will argue blindly that mm-hmm. they tried their best to help us i would say they <laughs> weren't that bothered <laughs> Um, because it already, as far as I'm concerned, they never really mm. understood what was happening anyway. I think it's not a priority, you know, and at the end of the day, there were people that when we had to move, there were people that lost yeah. their businesses because of that. I mean, I don't think anyone's any illusions that's brought as much money into the city mm. as, you know, HMRC mm. who can have their headquarters there. Well, what I'll make clear is I've had no problem with the fact that we had to move out of that building because it was always a deal and it was going to happen one day and we had a lot longer than we thought we were going to have. We thought we were going to get. Mm-hmm. Our problem is not with the owners of the building or landlords or anything like that. It's actually that political will. There wasn't more goodwill mm-hmm. to keep you know, mm-hmm. people in the city, including Vane. I mean, one way. I mean, let's say we were one way we mm-hmm. weren't worried that we were going to shut down. We have more safety net on like someone that's going to you know, graphic yeah. design business or whatever that had renting a very sort of cheap studio. It's a long time since I've been bothered because I don't really want to, I'm not interested in playing the game really in some ways. But it was years ago now, a few years ago. But, you know, if you look at what Vane has 
I, I'm dubious about economic impact assessments and things like that because people make things up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On both sides, you know, people say like whether it's opening a new shopping mall mm-hmm. and saying this is going to bring you know X amount to the city, or whether it's a cultural organisation going like, will we bring X amount into the city? People make things up, and that's just the truth of it. Having said that, what's Spain had in the money? I mean, we've had over a million pounds of public funding mm-hmm. over our lifetime. Not every single pound of that has been spent within Newcastle, yeah. but however, I mean, we both live here, but I pay my council mm-hmm. tax. You know, things, <laughs> things like that. Is it well that hasn't been retained in Newcastle mm-hmm. now? Well, yes. Maybe you know, say, well, I still live in Newcastle. I haven't left the city in protest, yeah. but we weren't very supportive to, like, you know, relocate. But I mean, over time, yeah, yeah. and there's other all the time it added up. There's a lot more money that came in from other people. You know, some, yeah, some people stay, some people have gone. I bristle when I see sort of talking to the council about supporting micro businesses and things. I don't think that's the case. Yeah, mm. well, it's not my experience. <laughs> yeah, it's as controversial as I'll get on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It'll be a bit wildly denied by anyone at the council, and they'll say we did so much to help try and help you, but you just turned down unviable options. Anyway. Yeah, I think people remember certain things, and we know what happened, whatever they say. That has all been incredibly insightful. I feel very lucky because I feel like this has been the moment where you both needed to (laughs) really reflect and get stuff off your chests, even just a little bit, even if you couldn't say everything you wanted to say, but you've been guarded. You've really gone into... You want to get sued. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, I just really appreciate that. You, You went and answered just every question I think I had as well. Do either of you have maybe any messages of hope? Do you have any hope for the future of the arts in this region? That sounds a bit bleak. That there will be some, (laughs) you know, because coming from Northern Ireland, I feel the pain of the arts community in this place. We're very arms reach as well. And people just have to get on and do it themselves. Northern Ireland's had particularly sort of bad experience in terms of support in the pandemic. That's my perception of it, reading stuff that people have been left with political whatever sort of wrangling that's already there. Sort of like people have been left in limbo. You know, there's only so long you left in limbo before you actually go under. Yeah. That's very unfortunate. I mean, I think, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, it's going to go back to my whinging, but it's difficult because in one way, I feel like, you know, we are, a lot of artists are very resilient and mm-hmm. we'll find a way through, you know, and like you say, you get cut down for a bit, like a dandelion, you know, you'll <laughs> mm-hmm. around the next spring again, whether people like it or not. However, you know, I'm wary of using that, whatever it is, is it an analogy, you know, or narrative, because actually it's also, I feel like I don't want to actually encourage this sort of exactly. sense, sense that, oh, because it's like a vacation or even a hobby at mm-hmm. worst or something like that, yeah. that mm-hmm. oh, we'll just do it anyway. It's actually, it's talking yourself out of getting yeah. that kind of support yeah. that I feel you should be getting. On the other hand, I will survive. I don't have an answer because it's impossible because I think where we are at the moment, mm-hmm. is, as in where we society are at the moment I think it's really impossible and I think it's a bit of a rush to come up with answers but I really don't know you know I don't think we really quite comprehend what's happened over the last two years and I don't mm-hmm. just mean about sort of what obviously it's about things about whether you think you can pay the rent or not mm-hmm. but it's also you know without a I don't have that much of a spiritual side but I think we've been through a massively traumatic experience mm-hmm. and it is traumatic about how we actually go forward and despite you know the government sort of saying it's over mm. it's not over and you know it's still a long sort of tail I think to what we've sort of been through to a certain extent a certain part of rebuilding mm-hmm. and maintain over the last couple of years but also trying to do things differently you know and I think mm. I've been doing a lot of reading around this you know I think when we look at the pandemic sort of look you know went through the first lockdown there's a lot of fight there in people but in some ways even though it was so grim in so many ways mm. it's kind of lost positivity now because this is kind Kind of gone on yeah there's a lot of i don't know sort of built up angst and sort of anger and things yeah. like that and actually i don't know that we did this is again and i know i come across that like very dark here there's still a lot of actions to be taken if we're actually going to come out of this better than we went in yeah. the danger is actually we're worse and i think we're seeing that in our government at the moment mm. where it's almost a sort of contempt yeah for actually doing the right thing yeah. what you think is the right thing i'm not saying we're so virtuous but you know it's kind of like well, more virtuous than boris johnson <laughs> <laughs> the choices to be made, and there's lots of directions being given, but I think there's still quite a lot of choices to be made about well, actually, are we, how differently do we do things, or how much do we just put sticking plaster over, trying to scramble back yeah. from what was the biggest challenge, you know, since the Second World War, really, I think, to society. It's not just about, oh, we'll start up again. Sorry, we've been closed the last two years. This is a whole different way of doing it, a whole different way, you know, and there's all the other things that have happened 
been highlighted because they've not just happened over the last two years mm. who's sitting around the table and who isn't mm-hmm. yeah again the biggest a lot bigger debate about that you know sort of where we might stand in that you know who we might represent mm-hmm. you know who we've got a duty to try and represent we've always looked at it we're kind of looking at it as well with trying to take on board different kind of discussions about you know representation yeah. that have taken place recently mm-hmm. thinking like you know what is our route and in terms you know whilst being realistic about what we can do yeah. as two people but you know still having some let's say we've, we've always felt that responsibility but actually where do we get other input into yes. that you know and try and make sure that we're part of addressing the problem not solving the problem because i think that's what i'm trying yeah. to get at really yeah. sometimes it's kind of like, there's a bit of a pressure sometimes to try and make out that you're sort of saying like oh you know well we do a b and c and then we've dealt with that yeah. again it's an ongoing thing it's not for certainly not for two people to kind of you know solve the problems of the world <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> if could the powers but you know it's but sort of taking responsibility that we have a responsibility to be part of the process yeah. you know, sort of moving forward so it does mean doing things differently to how we did before yeah. mm-hmm. and doing a lot of thinking around that if i'm sounding a bit sort of i'm not really sort of being very explicit about it because i'm not trying to preempt how that might manifest itself it's still very much a work in progress but get back to your original question there's responsibility on us all individually mm-hmm. collectively mm-hmm. Or organization institutionally whatever to try and make things work in a better way yeah. mm-hmm. it's not a foregone conclusion that that will happen whilst we're all scrabbling around to actually sort of still sort of come out of this terrible thing that's happened yeah so i feel like i just want to end on a more positive <laughs> <laughs> it's optimistic. i am optimistic i am optimistic things are a struggle sometimes i mean things all sorts of struggles we've had the struggle of all times you know recently mm-hmm. but i do actually despite how i might come across remain optimistic mm-hmm. otherwise i would give up and do something else mm-hmm. but to have given up you know and actually you know aside from the obvious over the last couple of years you know, i've had to fight very hard actually to keep going and i've been working i we have been working with people like say we've lost a few along the way yeah mm-hmm. to be like sports you know but have also actually helped quite a few artists and non-artists as well actually keep their businesses going mm-hmm. during this time mm-hmm. so we're still kind of dealing with keeping going yeah. but yeah, yeah still being open yeah. to that we need to change still making advocating i suppose for doing things in a different mm-hmm. way because there's plenty of people we're sort of saying posing certain kinds of solutions they're not necessarily i mean that's always that's always been the case in one way that certain things are imposed on you but you have a choice i suppose is the point i'm making about how you address that really about you can take the easy route you can tick box just put your head down yeah. and take the money and get on with life or you can challenge things you know and if you don't set ex- you can challenge things both by directly challenging things which is why i don't invite you to certain stuff um but, but you know also you can actually just challenge things just by doing stuff yeah. in a certain way again i'm trying not sort of blow my own trumpet and saying lead by example i was really pompous I'm kind of say that but just do stuff just do stuff and show that it's good yeah. the choice I'm going to sum up now the choice <laughs> yeah. is whether you actually are interested in trying to affect change or whether it's just performative. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. You know, in the art world, there's a lot of people that are only really doing performative change, you mm-hmm. know, and it's very easy to do that. I think there's a lot of lip service going on. There's a lot of tokenism. And I think the real thing that is we need to see more of is this just this integrity. I, mean, I think we've got, I think I'd like to think we've got that. And I think that most, a lot of, you know, a lot of people do and it's just but to see that actually coming into play more i think Mm -hmm. people really taking taking control of their own lives but take control of the situation take control of the development of this whatever we call it this art ecology but taking control of what's happening but doing it with a real integrity Mm -hmm. that's what's needed and what that's what's happening but it needs to be more of it because there is sort of tokenism i think as i said Whilst actually, I could take it back to a negative point here, but whilst actually we've got a government that is actually interfering more and more yeah. and mm-hmm. money is less and less arm's length. Yeah. And there's, I don't know, I'm not saying I'm doing it, you know, but there's less and less defenders mm-hmm. that principle. Mm-hmm. And the pandemic hasn't has majorly not helped with that. Yeah. And people are clinging on. There's less of a incentive to kind of actually challenge mm-hmm. this sort of interference. Mm-hmm. And again, sort of through the pandemic, well, there was so much talk. I mean, when, you know, particularly freelancers have suffered so much in terms of financially mm-hmm. during this time but there's so much talk about what did you do you know especially in the first lockdown you know where you read a book whether you're watching you know a film or watching mm-hmm. a soap opera or whatever you know all those people mm-hmm. all those actors and script writers or whether you're just looking at a picture on your wall yeah. someone made that yeah yeah and I, I almost feel like that's almost beginning to sort of be it was said it was said a lot in the beginning of the pandemic and actually did you need to keep saying that you know but we've got a government that's reduced amount of funding for art students yes yeah still saying art subjects are not essential mm-hmm. 
art has a great capacity and arts organisations have a responsibility to affect social change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But don't play at being fake social workers. Yeah, you know, it's not this mechanism. That's a job for someone else or work with people that know what they're doing. In a meaningful way. Yeah, you know, like it's in a meaningful way. Don't do pretend. Like it's going back to ideas like performative change and it's not necessarily even a conscious thing. Mm. Kind of look outside yourself and look outside your own immediate yeah. mindset which is can be challenging, but it's challenging, it's especially challenging when we've all been on the defensive of yeah. actually just in hard survival mode. But there's still hope. Let's leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> I still I still believe. I still believe in art. I still believe. Yeah. Well, some really important messages I think that we need to reinforce. I can't thank you enough, both of you, for all your time today. Chris, could you point people towards where they can find out more about Vian, the website and that kind of thing? Well, yeah, we, we, we obviously we have go to our website, vian.org.uk. You'll find well, all sorts of things. There are videos of shows as well as uh, essays that we've uh, commissioned on various artists and, and shows. We have social media. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so you can. Down with the kids. <laughs> so, Facebook for older people like us. But we do. <laughs> we do do Instagram. Vain Gallery for all social media. Yes. Vain Gallery yes, for all. Yes, just Vain Gallery for all media. social media. Instagram and Twitter. For the, down with the kids, yeah. <laughs> we don't do Snapchat. <laughs> or TikTok. Not on TikTok yet. Not on TikTok channel yet. <laughs> but coming soon? No, I'm joking. <laughs> 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 You've enough to be getting on with. Yeah. <laughs> of all that noise. Well, like just wishing you every best wish for what's to come in the coming yeah. year. I really hope I can get to get said in a few months and be able yeah. to visit you in the premises. And I miss it. I really miss V and I miss Commercial Union House. I spent a lot of time in Orbis yeah. and I miss it desperately. So I just really am so appreciative of both of you taking so much time to talk to me. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Cheers. Talking to you.